Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today, we're gonna to talk about thyroid. On the board behind me, I'm gonna go over some of the physiology of how thyroid hormone works, and then we're gonna go into how thyroid hormones impact health, okay? So today, we're gonna to talk about hypothyroid, so basically under-functioning thyroid. If we look at thyroid physiology, it actually starts in the brain and has a loop back, okay? So if we have a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, it releases a hormone called TRH, or thyroid-releasing hormone. That will send a signal to another part of the brain called the pituitary gland, and it will signal the pituitary gland to release another hormone called TSH, or thyroid-stimulating hormone. Now, when you go to your endocrinologist or your primary doctor and you complain about fatigue, one of the first things they might check for you is this marker, TSH. So TSH is actually a brain-based hormone, and they're looking to see if you have enough TSH or the proper levels of TSH to stimulate the thyroid gland, which is at the base of your neck. So when you look at the pituitary and releases TSH, that hormone will go and signal your thyroid to release two basic hormones. One is something called T4, and the other one is T3. The thyroid actually produces predominantly inactive thyroid hormone, T4. So the thyroid actually produces 93% inactive thyroid hormone, and it produces T3 about 7% active hormone. So why does the body do that? Right? So if the thyroid produces inactive hormone, so it has to go through some physiological effects in other end organs in order for the inactive T4 to convert to T3. So when the T4 inactive hormone is produced by the thyroid, it will be transferred over to the liver. And the liver will convert about 60% of that into T3, and another 20% might be inactive, and another 20% will have intermediaries, and that intermediary will go to the GI tract, basically your gut lining. Well, your gut bacteria will help convert your thyroid hormones from inactive to active, okay? So let's re read that, review that real quick. So the hypothalamus reduces TRH. TRH goes to the pituitary, releases thyroid-stimulating hormone, and that is the hormone that most doctors will check. And the thyroid re will release T4 and T3. T4 is another uh, typical one that uh, medical doctors will check. And that inactive hormone will go to the liver and it'll be converted to active hormone partially. And another small portion will go to the GI tract where it will be converted to the active T3 hormone. Uh, another thing that impacts the hypothalamus are two neurotransmitters. There are many, however, the two primary ones that affect the hypothalamus is dopamine and serotonin, okay? So uh, if you think about dopamine, it's about pleasure, and serotonin, people think about uh, happiness and um, uh, antidepressants, right? So these neurotransmitters actually impact the brain, right? So that's your basic physiological processes that occur with the release of thyroid hormone. Brain to the thyroid, to the gut, to the liver, and back up as a feedback mechanism to the brain, okay? When you have hypothyroid, your TSH will rise, okay? So when this marker goes, let's say the lab ranges might range from, let's say, 0.5 up to 4.5. Anything above 4.5 on the lab, they would consider as a hypothyroid patient. But we have to understand, why do people have hypothyroid? What is the cause? What is the underlying mechanism? The underlying mechanism for the most uh, number of patients here in the United States is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, a autoimmune condition that impacts the thyroid, okay? Globally, it's probably iodine deficiency for hypothyroid, but here in the United States, 
is typically Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and it could go as high as 80 to 90% of the population who have hypothyroid may have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay? So that's your basic physiology. Now let's talk about how thyroid hormone can impact our body. So thyroid underactivity, patients don't realize or people don't realize that every cell has receptors for thyroid hormone, right? As a matter of fact, it's not just on the outside of the cell, it's inside the cell, right? There will be actual uh, DNA expression as a result of thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is crucial in terms of uh, regulating your metabolic rate, right? If you do not have enough thyroid hormone, everything will slow down. So it will decrease your metabolic rate in all the cells, right? That's why everything just slows down. I am tired. I am losing my hair. My nails are not growing or they're getting very brittle. I am constipated. My skin is dry. And the reason is you need thyroid hormones to talk to the cells in order for it to function at its optimal rate. So it will decrease metabolic rate in the cells. Another thing it will do is it will decrease GI motility. So one of the most common findings that I find with patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis is when they come in, is that they have uh, a complaint of GI issues, right? It could be bloating, it can have like pain as a result of gallbladder or lack of contraction of the gallbladder. It can be constipation. It could be diarrhea. It can be quote unquote IBS. But in reality, they could have a lack of thyroid hormone, right? So we have decreased metabolic rate, decreased GI motility, a decrease in release of enzymes. So if you have decreased motility and you have lack of enzymes to break down your foods, like your proteins, your carbs, um, and your fats, then you're not going to absorb uh, your nutrients properly, right? So when you don't have enough release of enzymes and you have hypochloridria or low stomach acid, and you're not breaking down your foods, one of the leading causes of anemia can occur an anemia called iron deficiency, right? Iron deficiency. So when a patient comes in and they don't have a GI bleed and they're taking enough iron in, yet they are still anemic and they have iron deficiency, you have to ask, are they even breaking down their foods appropriately and absorbing it and getting it into the bloodstream and into the cells, right? So iron deficiency can occur. Another iron def uh, deficient, uh, anemia def uh, that, can, that can occur is megaloblastic anemia as a result of B12 and B9, right? Um, and because it's malabsorption. Another form could be pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disease where you have antibodies to intrinsic factor in the stomach, right? Then you will not break down your uh, foods appropriately and not absorb your B12. And anemia can occur as a result. So if you look at it, decreased rate, GI motility, decreased enzymes, hypochloridria, or low stomach acid, which can, can create anemia. And then another thing is it can also affect growth hormones. Growth hormones will eventually convert to uh, insulin growth factor one or IGF-1. And you need growth hormones, right? You need the, these good hormones to be uh, vibrant and young and healthy and so forth. So it can actually decrease the production or the conversion from growth factor to IGF-1, right? Another thing it can do is alter neurotransmitter expression. What does that mean? Because neurotransmitters need to get to its location to have an effect. Like in the other uh, side of this board, it said uh, dopamine and uh, serotonin, which are neurotransmitters, impact the hypothalamus. So if you have an altered neurotransmitter expression, then things will not work. Things in the brain will not work properly. Another one is norepinephrine, epinephrine. But you need these uh, neurotransmitters for it to work properly. Also, a diminished uh, lipolysis. 
if you don't have proper thyroid hormones, you can't break down your fatty acids, right? You can't break down the fats in order to uh, utilize it for energy and fuel and so forth, right? Another thing that can occur, is it, it decreases phase two liver detoxification. It decreases the ability of your liver to detoxify. It basically creates a dam within the liver. It creates a blockage between one part of the liver to the other part of the liver or different phases of the liver. And then you can become more toxic as a result, right? Detoxification issues with the liver. Another is an increase in production of sex hormone binding globulin. Why is that a, a bad thing? Sex hormone binding globulins will bind to the sex hormones, things like estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. It will bind, right? And it doesn't release it. So there are two sets of hormones. One is called a free fraction hormone, and another one is total. So let's say you have a lot of testosterone, right? Total number of testosterone is a lot. But if you have a lot of sex hormone binding globulin, it will just bind to the testosterone and not release it so it can have an effect at the receptor site. So it can't have the physiological effect. They have to be unbound from the sex hormone binding globulin for it to work. So if you have an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, your hormones, even though you might have good levels of it, is not working properly because it's not uh, allowed to be free to go to its receptor site, right? So thyroid hormone has more, a lot more uh, effects on the body other than what I just mentioned, right? It has a huge brain impact. Um, it has a, a lot of cognitive difficulty issues, mitochondrial function. It has a lot of different uh, impact. However, we just wanna focus on a few different things, more common things, right? So when a patient comes in and they say, Dr. Sung, I have, I'm tired all the time. Right? And that's their main complaint. You have to kind of dig a little deeper and say, what else is going on? And then run the proper testing. Right? If you look at thyroid physiology, you have to be able to depict where the problem is. You can't just say, oh yeah, TSH is high, therefore you have hypothyroid. But what if they have Hashimoto's, Dr. Sam? Right? What if they have Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune disease, and because of that autoimmune disease, no matter what medication they take, they don't feel well, right? And that is the next question that we're gonna ask and answer on our next video. What can we do beyond just taking a medication for my thyroid, okay? My name is, my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week for part two of thyroid. Please share and like the page so more people can uh, learn about how the thyroid works. Have a great day.